Welcome to the New Books Network. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the New Books Network. I'm your host, Daniel Paris. My guest today is Professor Michael Friendly, a professor of psychology at York University in Canada. He is the author of a just published, uh, really interesting book, uh, A History of Data Visualization and Graphic Communication, uh, with co author uh, Howard Weiner. Uh, professor Michael Friendly, uh, thank you so much for agreeing to be on the show. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm really, I'm really glad to talk to you about it. Well, it, it's uh, an astoundingly good book. I'm going to lead with that now. I mean, th- these interviews are designed to promote books, but I'm, I'm going to go off the top and say this is an astoundingly good book, particularly for someone, and there are thousands of us, in finance or in any quantitative field of endeavor where we're using charts all day long. And I've been in this profession for 20 years, and I have been looking at charts for 20 years, and I've been adjusting charts for 20 years. And uh, the meaning of the charts depends on the adjustments, and I'm afraid I'm not alone in having done that. So I was absolutely delighted to see you kind of provide a history of uh, visualization of data. And uh, for me, it's really, I think, an important, almost corrective to how we, uh, many of us in a data-rich field, almost abuse charts, a day, uh, abuse data visualization. How did you come upon this, uh, this, this very important project? Well, I have to say my, my day job, if, you, if I can say it that way, um, has been as a statistician and as a developer of graphical methods. So I'm one of the geeks who creates new kinds of graphical methods for complex data beyond, you know, simple scatter plots and bar charts, but for looking at cross-tabulated frequency data. I was one of the developers of a chart form called a mosaic display. I was working on this in the 1970s, and I thought, wow, this is something really new and sexy, and everybody should know about it. I'm one of the first people to do this. Well, it turned out that that form of graphical display had a really long history that I did not know of. And people who, like me, were developing new graphical methods had no awareness of. About 25 years ago, 1995, I went to visit a friend and colleague in Toulouse in France. He showed me the most miraculous statistical volume, the album de statistique graphique from 1884, one of a series of 20 volumes, the most magnificent, beautiful, um, mind-blowing graphics I had ever seen in my life before. And in this volume, he, my friend Antoine found it in a, um, you know, like a, a secondhand bookstore, was an early form of a mosaic display. But not only that, it was so magnificent. Um, I thought, oh, my God, there is a long history here that nobody knows about. I believe you have a couple couple uh, plates of that uh, uh, publication in in the book, or you discuss it where they only did about twenty years worth, and you said, I think they ceased doing it, and the English ceased doing it because it was just too expensive, too beautiful, too labor intensive to produce an annual demographic of everything in the world. That's in right, detailed fashion. They did them. They did them in France, but also in the U.S. The U.S. Census atlases, and then there were um, sporadic atlases in Germany. Um, uh, Finland, you know, other places as well. This is a part of the history that I call the golden age of statistical graphics, a time when before there was not such great beauty and such great innovation. And afterwards, there was not great innovation either. The period from 1900 on is what I call the modern dark ages of data visualization. Why? Because the enthusiasm at the state level for these kinds of 
magnificent graphics had waned and, as you mentioned, had become uh, way too expensive to continue on an ongoing basis. Um, the period in the 1800s was more generally described as one of um, the incredible growth of data. We talk about big data today, but in that period from 1820 to 1880 or so, in every area of human endeavor, commerce, trade, medicine, health, crime, state governments, France, England, the U.S., were beginning to think of the world in terms of data, things that were measurable, that if, if we have a social problem like crime, how do we decide what to do about it? You know, philosophers might have said, oh, build more prisons. Other people, the liberals might have said, no, no, educate people, give them job, give them meaningful jobs to do, um, uh, enlighten them. But without data, no one can make these decisions. What, what to do about unemployment? Well, in economics, um, one of the remarkable set of graphs was by Phillips. The Phillips curve in economics was one of the first times that someone had looked at the relationship between um, unemployment and um, other factors in graphical means and saw a cyclical pattern that nobody could have imagined without making graphs of the data. Yeah, the Phillips curve is uh, obviously a very important topic uh, right now in the economy. And I'll tell two stories. First of all, it's about the relationship between uh, labor costs or wage costs and the unemployment level, which uh, I believe is 1958, if I'm not mistaken, is the Phillips. Uh, I, I believe curve. so. Yes. It's a little bit later at this point, I showed and discussed the Phillips curve to my contractor. Remember, labor in the United States now is really, really tight, and he hand wrote his own alternative Phillips curve, and it was at the diagonal to the Phillips curve. And he said, "This is what happens when you mention the Phillips curve to." certain of his employees, and the diagonal was the uh, uh, number of uh, incidents of being late, lazy, and insolent. <laughs> and it's going up in the opposite direction to the, the, the Phillips curve. So uh, my, as I put in a, a Twitter post, uh, microeconomics beats macro, uh, meets at macroeconomics and leaves it uh, and devastates it. So, uh, <laughs> so much for the Phillips. But uh, let, let's, listen, we're getting kind of ahead of this. You, you have a story as to how you got interested in data visual. You're a data scientist, effectively a psychologist, but very concerned about how people react to data. Uh, but being a psychologist or even a, a data scientist doesn't lead directly to the history of all of these things. You had this, this, uh, this moment with the French uh, almanac. How, did, uh, how do we get from uh, a, seeing a French almanac to uh, this book in front of me? So that, that's, 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 a great, that's a great question because that is something that consumed me after seeing these classical works, I realized that nobody since um, H. Gray Funkhauser in 1936, he was the first person to write a history of graphical methods. Before that, um, Etienne Jules Marais wrote the very first book collecting graphical methods, but these were, these were, you know, had to do with recording um, physiological, you know, blood pressure, uh, recording motion, um, other kinds of mechanical devices. So the first guy who treats data visualization as a, as an historical topic is Funkhauser in 1936, that it was still sort of a landmark work. Um, it's p things that data, that data visualization historians refer to, but nobody thought to try to update that. So um, I began what I called the Milestones Project. Um, there's a link that, uh, to my website. It's dataviz.ca slash milestones, I began to try to make a complete, as complete as possible, a catalog 
of all the innovations and historical aspects related to data visualization. And again, I just want to emphasize to, I think, to, to my audience, which is substantially in finance, uh, and, and you objected to this when I emailed you about this before, but I'm going to still make the point. We're working backwards from an Excel chart, and we in finance take Excel charts and scatter charts and plots and the lines associated. We just take them for granted. It's just we take them for granted. And if we want to change the meaning of the chart, we change the axis. If we want to change the meaning of the chart, we change the data, data set. We, we adjust the data set. We throw out a, f- a few more outliers. And it happens all day long, everywhere, in any quantitative field. But we take as a given the importance of the visualization of the data, how we intellectually or psychologically respond to it, to try to make a point, generally our point. In a, we take the charts, put them in PowerPoint presentations, and hopefully we, we win the day, whatever the day is. And I, I think it's, it's incredibly important for those of us in, in battling with data every single day to know that that whole thought process had to come from somewhere. And it is not, you know, uh, 5,000 years ago with pillars of salt in Mesopotamia, they weren't charting, you know, relative values and, and curves and putting uh, trend lines in them. That all had to come from somewhere. And again, it's kind of stating the obvious but actually, there was a tremendous amount of intellectual legwork in figuring out longitude and how far Toledo is from Rome and all of these things, which are, are substantially visualized uh, uh, with tools that did not exist at the present time and had to be created and had to be conceived of. And the characters that you outline in the book make that mental journey. I think that's so fascinating. Do you want to highlight a couple of the early ones, literally? You know, you have examples from thousands of years ago, but earlier ones in the early modern period that begin to outline what we, ha- the, the, from which you could draw a line to how we visualize data now. Um, so, uh, first, 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 let me let let me say that that I am not a big fan of Excel charts. Um, the, Nobody the is. work the work that the work that the work that I do. Uh, people deprecate Excel Excel charts. So let's, but let's let's move on beyond there. They so, are ubiquitous, though, and they are you know a ubiquitous th- form of data ab- visualization. Absolutely, and one key thing in the use of graphics today is the ease with which one can have a problem, have data about it, and think. Oh my God, here is one way that I can try to understand that. Make a scatter plot to see the relationship of um, uh, outbreaks of COVID-19 to temporal factors, to regional um, geographic factors, to political factors. The idea, having the idea of trying to think visually is one of the key things that we've inherited from this long history. So in a sense, the, the, the title of our book is A History of Data Visualization and Graphic, graphic communication. communication. So that is a key thing. And as a cognitive psychologist, I want to understand how John Snow had the idea to plot incidents of death in the cholera outbreak. How um, Michael Florent Van Landgren had the idea to make a one-dimensional dot plot of the previous determinations of the longitude distance from Toledo to Rome. So one of the things, one of the main themes of the book that ties this history together. And this is, this is what I think is our unique contribution. We are not just catalogers of graphical innovations, as Funkhauser was, or um, as I started out my, um, my journey of, I'm, I'm actually an amateur historian, but amateur in the sense of, of love. So I cataloged all these things, but I began to see themes 
and I began to have some understanding of common threads that led from one kind of innovation to a new, another kind of innovation. So I like to think about, and in fact, this was an, an early candidate for a title of the book, A Gleam in the Mind's Eye. The, I, the idea that someone like Francis Galton thought about um, heritability of traits. He had the idea to think, oh, if I make a graphic, a, a table, but think of it as a graphic table and draw circles or ellipses of constant value, oh my God, here is a pattern that I can understand. And that led to the discovery of regression. Francis Galton, um, he's, I have, I have a bunch, I have six main heroes in the book that I talk about it. We can talk about more of them later, but Francis Galton, um, also, um, uh, some and you years. want to give a time 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 frame for him. So um, 18, 1886 is regression, but eighteen sixty four, Francis Galton discovered the patterns of weather. You look at your weather map in the newspaper today. You know, barometric pressure. You know, contours of high pressure, low pressure. It was Galton who discovered that. He discovered it by making 93 separate sets of graphs of mapping temperature, rainfall, barometric pressure from all, all across Europe, making a whole series of graphical displays. And remember, these are all hand-drawn graphs, folks. Hand-drawn graphs. He, he in yeah. fact, made up tiny little stamps, like rubber stamps, to put symbols for, you know, wind direction, for wind speed, things like that, on his, on his, little, on his little map. And again, this is part of the golden age of, of data collection and quantification of the world in the second half of the 19th century. That's right. But if we go back to what I call the first statistical graph which is Michael Florent van Langren's graph of longitude determinations from Toledo to Rome. And that's to, not Toledo, Ohio, people. That's not Toledo, right. Ohio. That's okay, right. Okay, let's, let's get with the program here. So what, <laughs> Toledo, what, he was, Spain. what he was doing was making an, an appeal to the king of Spain. He showed all of the previous estimates of that longitude distance by Tycho Brahe, by Regimentus, by, uh, by Ptolemy, by all of the great um, astronomers of the time. And the purpose of that graph was to show to the king the huge errors that everyone had made. The, the, the range of those estimates is more than half of the actual distance from um, from Toledo to Rome. I thought this it was interesting was, they were all short. They were all too close. That's right. Um, and so he, he, he drew this graph, sent a letter to the king and said, it was, it was a patronage request. He said, I, Michael Florent van Landgren, the best cosmographer in the world, I know the secret of longitude, which was, it was crucial for exploration, for trade, for discovery. In the 14th century, the Dutch, the, the, the French, the British um, were all vying for new... Let, let's stop there and just introduce that, everyone, because if you've ever used Google Maps, uh, you, you didn't like my reference to Excel, well, no, you're really not going to like my, my reference to Google Maps. But anyone who's ever used Google Maps should care about this. And the problem is, and anyone who's ever shipped anything or gotten anything shipped, anyone who's ever used Amazon, I'm going to exaggerate all these things, uh, anything crossing the seas cares a lot about this. Uh, latitude, which is the degree north or south of the equator, is not that hard to figure out and has been pretty easy to figure out really for millennia. Longitude, which is east-west, 
given how the earth spins, where the sun is and where we are, is really, really hard to figure out and was a mystery for millennia until really clocks and timepieces come along and allow it to be calculated with a a lot of other data in the early modern and and, uh, industrial period, uh, uh, seafaring period. But it's really, really hard, and it's a a requirement before you can have a global shipping system, frankly. That exploration system uh, is is getting longitude right. And uh, again, I'm going to make the leap, you don't have to, that uh, um, the origins of our ease of of mapping the earth and uh, is is dependent upon figuring out longitude and someone had to figure it out and these people did that's right that's a that thank you thank you for 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 adding that so um ben landgren's graph was essentially a plea to the king for money i will i know the secret you pay me a lot of money and i will give it to you and you will you will rule the world that was the purpose of this graph. Um, I, I forget whether the, the, I believe the king did give him a grant. Correct? Did he get? Money? He did, but sure. he did, but not, but not as much as as Van Langren wanted. And so the foot the footnote on this is um, Van Langren's method was actually not all that accurate, but it was a great improvement over what had been done before, and his idea was to record the location of a sunrise and sunset on the moon and shadows from from the craters and make it a more precise much more precise determination than just the absolute the the total position of the moon in the sky but eventually timepieces allow uh, – the introduction of accurate timepieces allow for more accurate calculations of longitude. Exactly. And that did not come for another nearly 200 years. John Harrison, the first – the one who, who developed the first accurate sea clocks. Okay. So we, we, we're making strides here. Longitude's a big one. Maps, uh, weather patterns, and so forth uh, – you also have some very early. We won't go over all of those those early, very early from uh, almost medieval period and beyond, and uh, antiquity. You know, early hints of of data visualization, graphic communication, but they're there. But as you say, we come to the uh, to a, a more complex society in uh, the nineteenth century, industrialization, and as you point out, for illness, for transport, you just need there's the, the demand is there for much greater information. I think one of the stories. It's out, a little bit out of order is, you know, you put a bunch of people together and that's relevant for today. You put a bunch of people together in a city without clean water, bad things are going to happen. Uh, one of the great statistical breakthroughs is associated with a cholera epidemic in London in uh, the 1850s. And there were what I thought was fascinating in your story is that uh, although the stories it's currently told shows the outcome of someone figuring out that there was a bad water pump, in fact, there had been many, many efforts prior to that where they just didn't have the right visualization of the data or they weren't conceptualizing the problem correctly and they they weren't getting the water pump as the source of the problem. Can you describe that? Well, so um, this is a really fascinating, fascinating period. Um, cholera um, and other other kinds of diseases broke out in, in incredible epidemics. Um, in Britain... Uh, there was a registry of of deaths, uh, the General Registrar's Office, um, under William Farr, who was probably the first um, British um, main statistician. Someone like um, he was sort of the he was not a medical person, but he was a statistician. But he was sort of the equivalent of Anthony Fauci in his day. He Mm -hmm. recorded the data. He looked for patterns. But the thinking at the time all had to do with an explanation of cholera as due to bad air. It was called the miasma theory. And there was ample evidence for that. The closer you got to the Thames, it smelled awful. The big stink was what the Thames was called. And it turned out that there were more deaths closer, the closer you got to the Thames. But that was not the causative factor. And so along comes Jon Snow, who was, um, he was 
somewhat more than your average family doctor, um, but he was not, you know, an esteemed um, medical practitioner of the day. He had the idea that from the symptoms of cholera, that is, you get you get cholera, um, your your guts empty out, you know, from top and bottom. People die mainly from dehydration. The pattern of those symptoms said to him, no, it's not anything to do with the air. It should be or has to be something related to what people ingest. But he had no you know, precise data on that. He began to think about water, water, a waterborne source for cholera, and in the 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 now iconic map of his, this dot map of Soho, he recorded one little square on the map for every single death, and he looked at it. Um, this is this is you know today not what one would call a really in you know, uh, knocks knocks you in the head kind of insightful graph. He noticed that there was a cluster, a big cluster of deaths around one particular pump on Broad Street. And he also noticed that uh, a little bit further away, there was a brewery. People worked in the local brewery. There were no cholera deaths around the brewery. He thought, why would that be? Well, he said, oh, everybody who works at the brewery can drink as much beer as, as, they, as they want. They did not drink the water from around there. Did so, they, I think, the, did the brewery draw its water from another source or just the process of uh, fermentation uh, uh, took care of the cholera? Well, um, it, it, was, it, was, it, was more the, it was more the latter. Um, uh-huh. They did not draw their water from a particular other, you know, From the Broad Street pump. No. Um, so um, he had this idea, but how, how does he convince the medical community, William Farr and all the scientific advisors? who All the, are, the miasma team. The miasma, the mias, the mas, mias, miasma team, that his idea is correct. Well, well he actually, he had a great deal of difficulty. And part of that was because he was so singularly focused on cholera as a waterborne disease that he didn't sort of pay enough attention to um, knocking down the miasma the miasma theory. Um, he the, the, the apocryphal story, and it is an apocryphal story, but it's a nice one, is that when he made that dot map and realized that the bulk of the de- of the deaths were clustered around the Broad Street pump. He went there and removed the handle from the pump, and bingo! Overnight, cholera subsided. Not true. Well, no, it's not. It's not it's good quite, story. Good story, but not. It's true. a good. So, it, in the history of data visualization, there are lots of things that are good stories, but not quite true. So you know the 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 famous work of Florence Nightingale. She is the lady with the lamp, the 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 person who is responsible for modern nursing as we know it today. And importantly, the concept that uh, at least at that time, which she, uh, officials understood that uh, uh, that more people die not from battle food, battle uh, deaths, but from being far from home, bad water, bad supplies, and injuries. Rather than for the field of battle, and you know, I don't know what the numbers are, but it was a common problem there that uh, that her nursing, in effect, addressed that the, the I'm not going to say 90 percent of deaths, but whatever the majority of fatalities that occurred off the battlefield. That's that's true. When when she began keeping record of cause of deaths, looking at deaths on the battlefield from. Uh, uh, um, what she called z- zymotic diseases. Zymotic diseases were, you know, like things things in the in the in the water supply, similar or or, or filth. Um, you know, p- soldiers 
wounded soldiers were lying in their own waste, yeah. um, being being you know uh, subjected to you know great in, great great infestation infestations. So when she got back to England, um, she set about to campaign for improved health care amongst the British British Army. Um, she made the famous rose diagram. There are many versions of it. Um, m- my colleague Raymond Andrews and I just wrote a short paper um, for um, an online journal um, tracing the history of this lovely rose diagram back uh, back back in back in time um, so it, it's only apocryphal in that um, uh, her contribution was not just an immediate effect of her drawing this graph and everybody having the insight that oh we got to do something different it was a sustained period of collecting data writing reports to British Parliament, documenting, documenting causes of death in the battlefield compared to in the general population in ways that were so compelling that no sensible person could believe that, believe that there were just, you know, some other explanation. And they sent as a result, uh, medical teams off battlefield, medical teams, to tighten up the ship off the battlefield and the, the uh, incidence of disease plummeted, if I'm not mistaken, as a result that's, of that. That's right. There was a sanitary commission sent in um, April 1854, and following the sanitary commission, uh, introducing new, new that is, things. Uh, digging latrines, separating housing, uh, making sure there's exactly. clean water and clean food. Stuff exactly. Stuff you think about normally, but that itself had a, a, a significant, statistically significant uh, impact on, on – uh, uh, illness among the troops. That's right, and I'm sure you. I'm sure you know the long-running TV series Mesh. Yes, I do. Mesh. So the Mobile Army Surgical Hospital, that was a direct result of her redesign of how we treat wounded soldiers in the battlefield. Mobile, be able to pick up and move in case you know there's yeah. incoming shells. Surgical hospital, um, you know, for 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 treatment of the wounded. Yeah, let's let's. Uh, we're kind of running out of time a little bit, but I want to mention one other uh, of that highlights of that period, and all, roughly in that period, uh, mid late nineteenth century, uh, there is one chart that is you know stand uh, the Broad Street Pump chart is uh, or table or, or scatter plot is known to many. But pretty much known to everyone is uh, Charles Menard's uh, graphic representation of the Napoleonic War, Napoleon's uh, attack on Russia. Uh, I'm uh, trained as a historian of the Soviet Union, so I'm very familiar with that. But it is perhaps the best single work of graphic communication and data visualization ever. I'm going to say you probably have your favorites, but at a popular level, I think it's by far number one there's it's hard to beat that yeah so it, it was um um it, most recently it was edward tufty who christened that as um the best data visualization ever drawn but that appreciation of menard's work actually goes back to Etienne Jules Marais, who wrote this book um, in 1875, 79, The Graphic Method. And he, he says of Menard's map, it astounds the imagination. It, it, um, it, um, um, it defies uh, it defies the pen of the historian in its brutal eloquence. Just think uh, about that. As a historian, I, I I give up. There's no way I could uh, I could top that. And what's interesting in the historical impact of that chart is uh, members of the German high command in the 1940s apparently missed missed the message because they essentially <laughs> uh, that's uh, right the exact same error. 
and I don't know if that chart was widely available at that time, but uh, who knows if they had seen that. that never, never, ne- never try to conquer Moscow in the winter. Yeah, I mean, it's not that <laughs> bad idea. Again, bad idea. Uh, but again, it, it, is, it is multifaceted. Uh, to some extent, the data is not that complex. It's the, it really, it's a map and amount of soldiers and time. It's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not uh, very sophisticated, but the visual impact of it tells the story better than any historian could. Um, our final chapter in the book is called Graphs as Poetry. And we talk about this aspect of Menard's map when understood in its historical context as one of invoking an oh my god moment look at the folly of napoleon goes takes 450,000 soldiers not only from france but from all his defeated territories takes them on this long march to moscow and comes back with only 10,000 of his troops could think about that what fraction what yeah. fraction survived so menard is one of my heroes i studied before menard was well known for more anything more than just this single image i studied his history i cataloged all of his all of his works and what we see in in menard is another uh, fascinating story of human history this is this is sort of what 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 wakes me up in the morning when I discover something sort of personal about what someone's motivation was, why why Menard made this graphical map. What was he thinking? So Menard actually had two different careers, all within the same institution, the École Nationale des Ponts. A chaussee, bridges and roads. He was an engineer. In his early days, he went around and did engineering projects. You know, where are we going to build a canal? Um, what do we What do we need for railway traffic if we're going to export our French wine to England and to other places? And we are importing cotton to to develop, you know, clothing manufacturing. These were the kinds of problems. But in his later life, in fact, after he retired, all French engineers were required to retire at age 75 on their birthday. He took up other topics, and the Napoleon's March graphic was amongst the last work that he ever did. Way to go out. I guess he never uh, – and but he did not live long enough to realize that he hit a grand slam with that. Um, he had no idea. I had no reason to believe that a hundred years later it would be the no, no, number, it was, one, number one uh, bestseller. In fact, in fact, had it not been for Etienne Jules Marais, Menard might not be known today. Uh huh. So someone else discovered that chart and popularized that's right. It. Uh-huh. A, a a near contemporary, and then um, Funkhauser picks that up and popularizes it in the 1930s then Tufty comes along and and talks about it as well in his in his first book and now there's so, posters of it on every college uh, dormitory a, that type of ab, thing a, absolutely i have i have i have small posters poster size copies i give out to the students in my data viz course who um, knock something out of the out of the park in the in a presentation or something or something like that, but so let me just say one one more little little background thing. Na- the Napoleon March graphic is the only historical graphical representation that shows a national defeat. In no other country, at no other time, did someone memorialize a national defeat. And so what was Menard's motivation? He wanted to show the folly of generals and politicians who for glory, for their own personal glory, would risk the lives of thousands and thousands of his own 
of his own people. And it is for that reason that the graph was so powerful because it's essentially a visual explanation of why Napoleon lost lost that, that campaign. So Menard got his place in history. The Broad Street Pump, if you look it up, you're going to find uh, the names of these physicians, the weather, history of the weather, you'll find these. But if you look up all of these things, you, you won't come across William Playfair. And I sense that you think that that's not quite right, that William Playfair belongs in this group. He's not there in the popular imagination. Your book tries to rectify that. Let's finish up with the contributions that that uh, that he made. Okay, so Playfair, Playfair actually was sort of a scoundrel. He was always scheming to and what time he he time frame eight, and location. Well, um, uh, he comes he comes online if I can put it that way. Um, Seventeen ninety. His main works um, span up to eighteen o five. But then he continued um, beyond that up to around 1820, 1825. We can, uh, a little footnote, um, we can talk about the cover of my book that I I take it that that you're not a big fan of. Yeah, I'm going to call out Harvard University Press and you and and Howard and say, for one of the best books that I've read in years, you have both the worst title and the worst cover. I thought that very interesting. Congratulations. (laughs) Well, um, the title, as I said, went through many iterations. Um, it was the editorial team at Harvard who who chose the the like really limp version. Yeah. I know. As I said, well, my first title was "The Origin of Graphical Species." Okay, <laughs> how's that? How's that? Uh, better than what this title is, but that's uh, and there are many others that would be better than the current title. But uh, and then, so there you go. Okay, um, but um, let me come back to the cover image after I talk a bit about Playfair, if I can. Yes. Can we do that? So, as I said, Playfair was he was somewhat of a, a scoundrel. I call him the the wily Scott, but he was somebody who had. The idea, the imagination to think of representing economic data in the form of charts, line graphs, time series line graphs. How did he explain that? Well, he said, if you want to look at um, imports or exports over time, think of in the year 1790, there were um, uh, three billion pounds of think of that as a stack of coins, the height of proportional to three billion pounds. The next year, it's four billion pounds. Think of that as a stack of coins, a physical stack of coins, the height proportional to that number. That was something that allowed for the first time, uh, you know, the ordinary business people and um, uh, people who would be called today economists to think visually about time series data in in a line graph, a simplified version of the stack of coins, which could be a bar chart or a line graph, um, is then understandable. And, And again, we take this as an everyday occurrence no big deal. But the fact is, as with almost all everyday occurrences in common, we, we take for granted, someone had to come up with it first. And he, you, your book kind of gives him credit for coming up with a lot of the basic data visualization that we now take for granted. Um, so this, this period around, just around 1800, we call the Big Bang in a same way similar to you know the origin story of the universe there was an instant or a short period of time when bang everything got created well playfair invented the pie chart the bar chart the line graph he invented all the modern graphic forms except for the scatter plot and we have some interesting stuff in the book about why Playfair missed 
some kinds of insights because he could not think of plotting one variable against another. Rather, if there were two time series, he would make two separate line graphs, looking at the price of bread over in time. Relation, over right. time, in relationship to um, the, the wages. wages that right, people but not were do saying. wage, but not do wages and bread. He would do the two time series, but not the not the uh, not, not wages, two y coordinates, not wages other. against bread, bread or right. bread against wages. Right. Right. Um, let, let me just mention one, another aspect of our book that we we that I'm I'm actually quite proud of. Um, we think we try to think in historical terms, but we also ask what could be done better or differently with the methods that we have today. So we have a theme throughout the book called revisioning historical graphs, RE hyphen vision. And so, for example, John Snow's graph, we we create it in a modern form using um, uh, bivariate density displays that are so much more perceptually clear than what John Snow did. And with Playfair, we you know, we sort of take a, a, a an opportunity to um, help help the master. I think of it as a, if John Playfair had come to me as a, as a consulting client, and he said, "Here's my data. Uh, what, I've done these beautiful bar charts and line graphs. What else could I do it do with it?" And I might say, "Well, John, do you ever think of plotting y against x?" <laughs> So where where do you think we're going? I mean, uh, to you, you're trying to nudge history along a little bit, but let's let's kind of finish up here with you know where we've come from, you know where we are currently. Uh, at whatever you may think of Excel and 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 PowerPoint and so forth, they are they are everywhere. The amount of data that's becoming available to all of us, big da- really big data now, is just overwhelming. It has to be artificial intelligence. So it, it has to be manipulated in some way, meaning uh, it has to be uh, processed. Do you have a sense of where, what will be, how we'll be thinking about data and data visualization over the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, and that's the beauty of taking an historical view. You put things in boxes with themes and you say well how how is this theme going to play out in the next 10 years that's that's much easier than just sort of um, globally trying to predict the future so um, one of the things that I see today is um, the huge amount of data but with input from human factors researchers computer scientists data science is a sort of a new of a new field software development my god um software development has made the task of actually producing a graph so much easier than it was before and not just not just throw your data at a spreadsheet and see what falls off the wall, but rather having an idea in your head for a kind of graph that you want to do and something like the grammar of graphics from Lee Wilkinson and now implemented in ggplot and in Python and in almost every language makes it possible for researchers People, you know, epidemiologists looking at COVID. Data journalism is now a burgeoning field. And in fact, some of the most impressive recent data visualizations have come from journalists who've realized that they can tell their story far better with graphs and with visualizations, perhaps with with text. So there is a whole there's a whole field of what's called scrolly telling, interactive 
websites that you can scroll through and not just read a story. But drop down data. Yeah. Drop down data. Yeah, right. cer certainly the COVID uh, pandemic around the world, unfortunately, lends itself to exactly this. And so uh, it's much easier to quickly look at a, a graph of cases than to, uh, to internally interpret, well, there were 2,300 cases in, in Allegheny County versus 2,035 the day before. It, it's, it's just much easier to instinctively assess better or worse with a graph, and it's much more efficient from a time perspective. But it, it's, it's even more than that, Daniel. It's being able to see multiple aspects of, let's say we're talking about COVID, multiple aspects that one could not even imagine trying to see in, in tables. So if you, if you look at um, uh, outbreaks of cases, say in, in long-term care facilities, yeah, this, was yeah. a, this was a major problem. Well, the epidemiologists and the people who looked at the data, they saw that far, far quicker by localized graphical displays broken down by, um, you know, age group, by, you know, amount, number of contacts and all these things far more readily than they could have in any way. So we, the, 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 whatever hopeful defeat of COVID there is um, will be due to two things. One is the, the rapid development of vaccines. Hopefully people will actually get that shot in the arm and the really fine grain of detail about data sources and, you know, um, other aspects that have been shown in graphical displays. Well, we will, we will hopefully be able to assess that when the second edition, perhaps retitled, but the second edition <laughs> of a history of data visualization and graphic communication by Michael Friendly and Howard Weiner comes out. The first edition is just out from Harvard University Press. Michael, thank you so much for uh, being on the show. It's really not only a fascinating book for me as a historian and a person who deals with, with data all the time, but also a really important one as we uh, finish up on discussing the pandemic. So uh, again, thank you so much for, for being a guest on the show. Daniel, I want to th thank you so much for, um, for, for organizing this. So um, here I am sitting in the south of France, but I'm thinking about the book and thinking about other, other aspects of data visualization. So this is, the, this is actually the first uh, chance I've had for a while to talk Good. about this there there will be more this book deserves to be well discussed i think you're gonna hopefully find your dance card filled with opportunities <laughs> take care thank you very so much